Imagine a world where straight A's aren't a product of endless nights reading books or marathon study sessions. As someone who's navigated the rigorous challenges of one of the toughest computer science programs at Georgia Tech and still coming out with a 4.0, I've been exactly where you are. Faced with seemingly insurmountable odds from less than stellar in structures to rocky starts in courses that felt like uphill battles, I've discovered and honed a collection of foolproof strategies. These aren't your average study tips. They're a guide by me, a self-proclaimed lazy student, to achieve academic excellence without the burnout. My name is George, and as a part-time student at Georgia Tech while also working full-time at Amazon, I've navigated pretty much every type of course and schedule. In a previous video, I unveiled the mindset needed to not just endure but also enjoy the study process. But mastering the mental game is only one side of the coin. Beyond mindset, there lies actionable, practical ways that will help you achieve A's. First, let's delve into a universal truth that is known but often not spoken out loud. Not all courses are created equal. We've all taken courses that were brutally hard versus courses that we breeze through to get an A. This stark variance is the reason why we need to focus deeply on course selection. Now, this tip has one slight caveat, which is if you're in STEM or engineering, your courses are kind of chosen for you, so it's a little bit tougher to apply this tip to select your courses carefully. But regardless, awareness of course difficulty is absolutely crucial. Start by researching courses taught by the university. I hate reading the syllabus, so even before that, I typically go online and try to read course reviews as well as what other people have done to stay successful in those courses. Sometimes for the courses, I even try to sort by easy to hard to try to find some of the easiest courses to really balance out my schedule. And eventually, like me, once you've taken a bunch of courses, you realize that courses fall into three distinct categories. The first one I like to call exam fest courses, which pretty much means your performance hinges on your test scores for that course. Second is the professor pleaser course, where you need to figure out the subjective criteria created by the professor of the class in order to succeed. Third are GPA graveyards, and typically you want to try and avoid these courses as much as possible because this is where your high GPAs go and meet their demise. So for most of you who've taken courses at university, these three types of courses probably feel familiar to you, but my main point is that the idea of course selection is very underrated. You want to try to be as balanced as possible. So for me at least, I try to find courses in those first two categories and try and find as easy as possible courses. But occasionally I do dabble in the GPA graveyard courses if I'm feeling a little bit masochistic or I really wanted to challenge myself in a course. But even despite the best laid plans as well as strategic planning for course selection, there is one thing that can really affect this equation. And I like to call it the professor paradox. So what is the professor paradox? The professor paradox is a wild card. This is a wild card where an amazing professor can make a GPA graveyard course actually be super interesting and really engaging. Conversely, less effective professors can make any course awful. So that's why I like to call it the professor paradox. And a classic case of this was my last year of undergrad. I was looking for some GPA boosters to like increase uh, my GPA. And I saw this one philosophy class that was supposed to be like a really easy A's. However, the professor was really boring. And basically what happened was I kind of just like fell asleep throughout the entire all the lectures and I did not get the A that I was hoping for. This is in stark contrast to one of my latter year neuroscience courses, which is probably one of the hardest courses I've probably ever taken. But I got an A plus in that course because the professors were really engaging and a lot of the papers that we were doing were extremely interesting and they had topics that I was also really interested in. So usually in my formula of course selection, I typically like to look at all of the course reviews from students, but I also want to see who is teaching it through Rate My Prof. Choosing wisely can help you find a hidden gem or a hidden thorn in your schedule, and this could be key to know before you enter a semester. I also have like another controversial tip, which is it is probably more advantageous in the beginning for you to have a lot of easy courses because it's a lot easier for you to find internships when your GPA is really good versus if you already have like a job offer or you already know what you're going to do post-graduation, then you can backload a lot of your harder courses and it's not like unless you like, you know, f flunk or like fail sort of your last courses, it's not like they are going to 
um, like your employer is going to resend any offers or anything like that. So um, typically I recommend that you have the easy courses at the start and then eventually backload some of your harder courses. However, mastering course selection is definitely only half the battle. Here's another very intuitive, but often not said truth. Not everyone in the class can get an A, even if everyone in the class is Einstein levels of smart. Now, why is that? Think about it from the college's perspective. So if you're a college, you need to maintain the reputation and integrity of your school. They can't just hand out A's like free samples, even if everyone is super smart, because this affects the integrity of their school. People might start questioning it, or people might find out about a class that's like super easy where you can get a lot of A's. So like I said, it doesn't matter if there's just like Einstein level students in that particular course. The university needs to find a specific way going into that class or creating this class so that only a certain percentage of people can get A's. Now that's gonna be key later on when I discuss some of the methods on how you can get A's in specific types of courses. The reason for that is colleges have specific ways of forcing only a certain percentage of people to get A's, and we can sort of figure out that system so that you can study a lot better. Okay, before we dive deeper, there is one caveat to what I'm saying in terms of colleges having to uphold a reputation. Not all universities operate under the strict curve of limiting A's. Take Harvard, for example, where grade inflation is pretty common. The same goes for many master's programs, where constraints on A's is less stringent and pretty much most students in the class can get A's. And it makes sense, right? Because if you go into the master's program, there's sort of a natural assumption that the students there are sort of already academically inclined. Um, the same way as in Harvard, they sort of assume that, oh, the people who are in Harvard are already at sort of a very high academic level, whether that's true or not. So for advanced degrees versus schools with already very good reputations, the rationale is similar. The pursuit of that degree is an achievement itself, so it really reduces the need for them to curve grades for students. But unless you're doing a master's degree or you are in one of those prestigious universities I was telling you about, you are susceptible to the curve. I think most people know what it is. This is to keep people with A's on a distribution so that only a certain percentage get A's. The curve is different based on the category of course. As a result, I will discuss each course type and how the curve works for exam fest, for professor pleaser, and for GPA graveyard courses. Okay, so let's start with test fest courses. How do you deal with this curve? So the first thing I like to do is something called slide surfing. So this isn't about memorizing every single bullet point in the lecture slides. This is about catching sort of the key concept and the key waves and the essential knowledge that you'll need. So what's the goal of doing this? The goal is to understand just enough so that you can dive right into the practice exams without wiping out per se. So I think here everyone has a unique rhythm in grasping the course content. Some may need more time, others catch on really quickly. Some people need to go to the lectures, other people need to sort of really read the lecture slides or go to TA office hours, but regardless, for me at least, my strategy is to take a really high speed review approach. So what I typically do is I play online lecture speeds at two times the speed. I sometimes like recording in-person lectures so that I can play it faster. Um, and I really repeat the process. So I try to go through it as many times as I can until sort of the course content starts to make sense to me. But the main point here is, is that you wanna figure out a way to try and finish the course content as quickly as possible so that you can start working on the practice exams. Okay, so once you start finishing the slide surfing phase, this is when you can start doing the practice exams. I try to tackle them head on, making a note of every single difficult question that's gonna be, that I've sort of found in the practice exams. Tools like Notion can be really great in tracking your progress, as well as really highlighting the areas that you need improvement on. The key thing is, is that this process isn't a one-time review where you do one practice exam and you're done. It's really about repetition. One marker for me is I try to go through every single practice exam at least three times. Another marker is if I'm able to finish the practice exams in less than half of the time um, of the actual time given for the actual exam, that means I know the content well enough to where the answer comes instantly to me. So that's like an indicator to me as well that I'm ready to take the actual exam. So basically my recommendation is you need to be really careful to where you say I actually understand 
the question right away. You need to be able to sort of see the question and without even finishing the question, you know right away sort of the approach and the answer you need to take. If you don't know it instantly and you're not able to finish the exam in half the time of the actual exam, that means you're probably not ready to take the exam and you need to do more practice tests. Okay, so I generally recommend for most people that you try to do this over the course of a semester. You go through lecture slides and then maybe through the final month you do a couple of practice exams and then you do more and more as you go along. But I have gotten into situations where I haven't reviewed the course content at all. So if you're really in a pinch, I do have like a really lazy formula where you can pull like some all-nighters to sort of go through the lecture content. And again, as long as you follow those indicators of doing enough practice exams to where you feel so comfortable with the course content that you can just like look at the question and you know the answer, then you'll be okay. So you can shorten this process to maybe in a week for most courses. But like I said, I do recommend that you try and balance out your schedule because the way I'm recommending is sort of for a last resort. Although this last resort did help me survive most of undergrad. Okay, moving on to the next type, professor pleasers. So these are courses that are filler courses that haven't existed for that long, but they need to offer it to students either for diversity or because of a specific major or because a professor just needs a course to teach. Oftentimes, these courses aren't really teaching anything that unique or particularly difficult. And that raises a problem because if the course by itself is not that difficult, then how do they grade people on a curve and make sure only certain people get A's? Well, in my opinion, they make it specifically very hard by making the criteria for an A kind of murky and kind of confusing for the student. And I feel like a lot of times, like, let me give you, let me give my sister as, as an example. Like she does this course and she's like, oh, like the criteria for getting an A is so confusing. She thinks that it's the course's fault. And I'm like, no. They're doing that purposely because only a certain percentage of people can get A's. It's your job to figure out what is needed to get an A. So this is where the pleaser part of the professor pleaser comes into play. So I'm not saying that you need to like, you know, give gifts to the professor or whatever. I'm just saying you need to show that you're willing to make an effort to do well in the course. And a lot of times you need to go to their office hours. The reason for that is sometimes the assignments, sometimes the projects, sometimes the presentations are going to be confusing. The rubric is not going to be that clear. And again, this is done, in my opinion, purposefully so that only a certain percentage of people can get A's. If you're willing to show your professor that you're willing to go that extra mile, go to office hours and have specific questions in terms of what's unclear, then it's going to make it a lot easier for you to get the grade that you want. So a lot of times, typically what I do is if it's an online course, that's even easier. I try to go on some like online discussion forums and read exactly things that students have been asking. But if it's a, an in-person course, then what I typically like to do is I pretty much try and go to most TA and professor office hours. And a lot of times you'll probably hear like students ask specific questions and then you can ask specific questions and eventually you get a really good sense of what's going to be, how the assignments are going to be graded as well as maybe if you do have exams, how those are going to be graded. Okay, so those are the first two categories. Now, the final category is the GPA graveyards. And there's really not much to say here. The Herculean trials, they're designed to gatekeep the prestigious realms of certain programs or maintain the illustrious aura of a academic rigor. I think the key thing to note here is the reason that they do exist is sometimes they try to prevent people from getting into a program or sometimes it's to persuade certain people not to do a specific major or to really try and figure out people who actually care about a specific course. And it's what I believe colleges try to do to really set apart students more. So if you do find yourself in one of these courses of your own volition or because you have to take those courses, then you really have to tread carefully. I don't really have any specific tips other than to pray in these types of courses, but I do think you know, applying all of the advice for Professor Pleaser as well as Test Fest courses will really help you down, down the line for this. But it's not all bad. So there's one last thing I didn't mention, which is how the curve changes depending on the type of course. If you're doing the Test Fest courses, it really depends on the difficulty of the course. I've seen sometimes the curve being applied on maybe the second midterm or the final exam because people were maybe doing really well in their assignments and their first exam. And they're like, and then the school is like, 
oh crap, like we need to actually figure out a way to decrease the amount of students who are getting an A in this class. So they may purposely make the final and the midterm a lot harder. You have to be cognizant of that by seeing what the grade average for the, for the class is. So same thing with professor pleasers. If there is sort of a lot of people getting really high grades, they're most likely going to curve it in sort of the latter assignments to make sure only a certain percentage of people get A's. The good part about the GPA graveyard courses is generally a lot of times the marks are so low that they're going to have to try and curve up or else nobody's going to get A's. I see this a lot with some of the mandatory engineering courses, some of the neuroscience courses I had to do. Even for one of my first year health sciences courses, um, everyone was getting like a really low grade. So they had to like literally bump everyone up by one letter grade. My point in saying all of this is, is that once you have an idea of the overall class performance, a lot of times they give like the class average, things like that, and you can sort of uh, compare that to your own performance. You can think, oh, they're marking really harshly. They're probably going to curve it or they're marking really easily. I really need to be really careful for the second and final midterm. So I've definitely made the mistake of going into the final being like, oh, like I'm doing so well in this class. The final is going to be really easy. Well, it turns out everyone was doing really well in that class and the final was actually really, really difficult. That's really tough because if the final is super hard and you're not ready for it, it can definitely lower your grade a lot more than you expect. I hope you realize that working hard is important, but it's also important to be as strategic as possible for both course selection and preparation. In doing so, I promise that you will both keep your sanity while also succeeding in getting those A's that you're looking for. But also getting a B or a C is not that big of a deal. So if you get that grade, don't think it's the end of the world.